Hello, welcome to the White Paper Review. This is the first episode. Um, I'm Brian Boys. And who, by the way, who are you? I'm Gordon Graham. And you know what? For more than 20 years, I've talked about white papers to anybody who will listen to me. I've written more than 300 of them for some big name companies like 3M and Google and IBM, and also for lots of smaller companies with big ideas. And I wrote the book, uh, White Papers for Dummies. And I'm known as that white paper guy. That white paper guy. Can you believe it? You're actually seeing him on video. And I'm, I do, I'm not quite as intense on white papers as Gordon. Um, I've, I've been a uh, copywriter for an ad agency. I currently do a lot of freelance uh, content, long form content stuff for people. Um, but I've written a book called uh, How to Write a White Paper in One Day with a video course, and it's done really well. So I know a little bit about white papers. And I've written for some big clients too, um, companies like uh, Pfizer, Zillow, Facebook and uh, WebEx, among others. So anyway, so the, the whole purpose of this show, you can see it's very back and forth, very informal. Gordon and I are each going to present a white paper that either we really like or we really think is due some criticism, right? And, and we're going to kind of bring out, hopefully, as you're watching this, the whole point of this isn't just to listen to two writers chat, but it's you're going to learn something about white papers and you're going to kind of see what goes into making a good one and you know there's just nothing like examples to really get a feel for what makes a good white paper absolutely so, so you can sort of think of this as a video swipe file you know with uh with some good stuff and then uh, at the back there's the bad stuff what to do and what not to do absolutely okay so i'm gonna go first see if i can make here's another thing see if i can make this work i'm now sharing my screen the, the one I wanted to talk about, I'm going to start off with, this is one of my favorite white papers. It's by um, a company called Ehong. I want to say Ehang, but I don't think it's a Chinese company. I think Ehong. Um, Ehang sounds like you would be like, I don't know, you know, in capital punishment, right? We don't want yeah, that. Really, yeah. make <laughs> and, electric chairs. <laughs> <laughs> what's really cool about what they make, I don't know, you can see the, the picture here. They make um, drones that people ride in. And you would think there's been, uh, it's actually being much more in the news these days, but it's kind of like the whole thing about the flying car. They keep reporting the flying car because people want to go around like the Jetsons. Well, human drones, um, they're, they, they're also known as autonomous aerial vehicles or uh, UAVs, urban uh, aerial vehicles, are basically going to make good on that promise, especially with the battery technology that um, we keep coming out with. And so these things, what I love about this company is that their, um, their white paper just says so many, it answers so many questions that a very skeptical person would have because you go, well, at first flying around like the Jetsons sounds like a really cool idea until you think of like more than two people zooming around like the Jetsons in a city. Like, well, are we just going to have like, you know, air crashes over, right? Over downtown, yeah. raining you know down. What I love, you know what I loved from that, Brian, was uh, remember the fifth, uh, fifth element? And they're riding yes. around in these cars up in space, but they had the in the air, but they've got like streets up in the air, right? So they've got levels. Yes, they've all all the all yeah. those, yeah. I, I think yes, all the dystopian or even utopian what right. They had like air streets, and even the Jetsons would go hop into traffic. And as you'll see, and I'll well, um, I can explain this a little bit. It's it's really because drones can be um controlled remotely with super accuracy that you can actually, you actually don't need pilots to run these things. And you can see a picture um, here. There's two of them in the air over a city in China. Um, and really there's a lot here. Let me show the table of contents. There's just, there's a lot that someone would want to know, especially someone who's skeptical about this whole thing because they're, they're battery powered. And you're wondering, well, is that safe to go up in a, in a thing that's basically like an oversized toy. And, um, I'm going to be checking on my notes here. So anyway, so the first thing I liked about this was it, it, it addresses all the doubts somebody would have about, it. is this even a good idea, let alone if your whatever Ehong is making is, is going to be the one I want to go with. Um, they, they answer the, the toughest questions. And in fact, they even answer the question of cost which I've never seen before. I, I was researching this for a while for a website I was developing and I went, I was at all the sites of all the major, there are all the major players in aviation are coming out with these. And this Ehong was the only one who said what one of these might cost. Um, so I thought that was, that's pretty bold because that's what people want to know about. 
And there's an eye popping number, 1.5 trillion. The global <laughs> market will be 1.5 trillion. Wow. It could be. I mean, you know, that's everybody says that's could be ever. Yeah. It could be, it could be if you just keep multiplying enough. That, and that's actually from a legit, um, that's quoted from a legit source. Um, oh, yeah. They quote, it's not just their own stuff. They really quote some great sources in this, including um, uh, NASA. NASA. And so it's like, yeah, so it's not, it's, they do a great job of just saying, hey, it's not just us hyping this product we sort of have. This is the fulfillment of what a lot of legitimate um, aviation companies and an organization like NASA um, says is good. Um, and so uh, let's see, basically, another thing that I really liked, I'm gonna have to zoom down here, just skim, skim through this. It's quite, it's 47 pages and it covers quite a bit. And I mean, it just gives- I love that, I love that picture there, you know, it's, and, and some tables, you know, they're nice. Yeah, pictures. yeah, yeah. And it, all this over here, over on the right is data. And what's incredible is they go through, here, let me show you this, they go through, and they give the specs of their all their competitors. And so if you're saying, well, how does this line up against what, um, for instance, Boeing is backing one of these. And um, for a while, Uber was backing one of these. And um, uh, the Airbus is, has got one. And so they just went in and they got the um, publicly available specs and they post them there. So you can, it's, again, it's what um, a great white paper is what, in the in the back of a skeptical reader's mind, what do they want to know? And so you um, you put that in there. So um, let me ask you, Brian. So sure. are you you're sitting there? You're sitting there in their vehicle, and somebody is flying you, or it's smart and it's flying itself. Well, yeah, it's it's it can be a combination. Like look here in this picture is kind of a, a good example there. That's like yeah. a, that looks like Houston's control yeah. room. No. That's actually what they use, and because. With the new 5G um, cell, there's, it's so data rich that they can, um, it would be like having a constant access to black box data, but in a stream and much more. So you would know like massive data on how the craft is doing, where it's positioned in the air and everything like that, how all its rotors were going and all that kind of stuff. You could have like, right now we have drone pilots who live in Las Vegas, right? And bomb people in the Middle East. So you could have, talk about remote work. You could be a, a drone bus driver and live in Seattle and work in Miami. Think about that or across the world. But also like you can set, you know, you've seen how drones can go. They're almost like a machine, like a machine shop precision. You can have a drone do a preset run. And so you could probably set them up where once this had been rolled out and showed to be safe, you could have them where they're just automated. It'd just be like taking a trolley, you know, on a cable. Um, it would just kind of do itself. Um, and then one other, I want to just talk, let's see, we're zipping through here again. I hope, they're not, I hope they're not running Windows. I hope they're running Unix or something that won't crash. On <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that. They've also thought through, as you're thinking about, well, what are all the products? So, so there's people going to crash into each other. And these things right now don't have a great range. And they talk about that. You don't need um, like a 15 mile range is in, for most cities will get you from downtown to the airport. So it would actually be at as the, um, the technology exists. And this is back in 2020 when this paper came out. It's still uh, useful. They show their, um, they show their apps and uh, their navigation system. And then, so they go, and right here, they're talking about, of course, why um, they, I, I'm a big believer in talking in the generic. So you say, oh, talk about the, talk up the generic, have evidence for the generic, but then at the end of your white paper, you're the one that fits the generic, right? Oh, yeah. And so yeah. What, that's what they're doing here. It's, they're calling it unmanned aerial UAM, which would be unmanned aerial, hmm, I think M is it was UAV, unmanned or AAV. Anyway, it means that um, the pilot's not there. So if their craft can hold two people, two people are in it, but it's being controlled remotely. And it actually, um, it makes it uh, safer in some ways because it, um, it takes out pilot error, which you can get. My brother's an airline pilot, but you know, without humans, there's the, the basic things that would go wrong. Um, and then they, but they actually, so going, going through how that would work and the, uh, the command and control that it would take to do that, the entire 
ecosystem you would need the landing pads and the charging and, and all that kind of stuff and of course it would have it would incorporate that you know pay with an app kind of cool thing we have with uber um but then they also and i'll have to get down here they got stats on everything and, and noise they're much quieter than helicopters um so oh. they go through all the good news i don't know if you can see here oh. like um there's oh, there's your the popular helicopter. mechanics you know we've been wanting this since the 40s um but then they talk about and let me find this so they talk about economics, okay? Now, wait a minute, what? Because there's lots of startups that actually it doesn't pencil out and they get a lot of investors and then they fizzle because there actually was no way to make money. So they address that. And then they address ways that um, the unmanned aerial uh, mobility, that's what UAM is, could improve. And they talk about, look, these are ways that technology needs to get better. And these are ways that as an industry, we need to get better. And so I feel like when you're, honest with your reader you're honest and you say look this is these are some drawbacks or this is why this solution isn't perfect like there's no silver bullet um and they go ahead and anyway they go ahead and address that i thought that was pretty good here's more and more stats i'm going to get us way to the end here i find those tables are really easy on the eyes they're nice you know yes the design is very nice isn't it um and i don't know how do you feel about logo on every page um Lots of companies do it. Yeah. I'm like, eh, am I gonna forget I'm reading about your company? <laughs> I turned the page and forgot it was about IBM or whatever. At least it's black and white, you know. That's true. Like jazzy green or something. I everybody remember. does it. Everybody does it. So at least in this case, it's kind of subtle. Um, at the very end here, and I'm a big, I'm a big believer in talking in either using a white paper so that you as an author, it makes you more of an authority. So if you wanna become an authority in a certain area, I say write a white paper, write a couple white papers and it will, it, it's gonna it's going to show your expertise and people are gonna say, oh, you wrote that white paper. You must know what you're talking about. Or if you have a white paper, especially for a big uh, publicly traded company like this, you want to assign, obviously a, a team wrote it, but you want to assign authorship to someone who's really going to boost the credibility of the white paper. And so you don't want to put like your marketing director, right. As the yeah. author. Yeah. And in this case, it's the, um, the chief strategy officer of the company. And so it's the guy who would know everything about this coming together. He would know the technology. He would know, you know, the, the difficulties, the competitors, the, the entire thing. So I just thought putting him as uh, the author just was kind of the icing on the cake. In yeah, it's interesting. Game. He has a Chinese name, but he yeah. was an MBA from the University of Illinois. So he's yeah. obviously really fluent in English. He might have written this. Oh, this might have been written. Oh, anyway. yeah, yeah. No, it's incredible. The language thing is actually incredible because as I was working on the project, I reached out to their PR people who were super great. Really, I'm a, I'm a little nobody working on this little nobody website. They were so nice. But they all had names like Kevin and, you know, yeah. Pete and, you know, I mean, they had like, well, that's not a Chinese name. And I mean, they're, they're basically, they're doing it to make us Westerners feel comfortable. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. that's a, it's, it's good PR. So they're actually in production and they have, it's really cool. I get reports on what they're actually doing with these things. Um, and it's, it's because it costs like one of these costs $300,000. Okay. So, uh, a helicopter costs like a million, a million, two million. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and you, then you got to have a pilot. So and then yep. it costs, minimum. and they got to be trained. They got to be. If you put out a new machine, the pilot's got to be trained for like weeks, right? And 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 you've got a helicopter has one rotor. So and they have a thing in it. I don't know if they all have it, but it's what holds the rotor on. They call it the Jesus pin, and if that comes out. <laughs> You're, you're, you're going to, you know, you're, you're headed for the afterlife. We're, I'm, just, see, I'm, I'm just reading a thriller where that's exactly <laughs> it, Brian. That's exactly it. Uh, Take uh, it. I, won't, I won't tell you the name of the book. It's a spoiler, but that's a, that pin it really is true. So take a look. Here's a, one of their machines. We're seeing it from the, from the bottom and you have, um, I believe it's eight rotors per side. So, so 16 motors, you could lose a quarter of your motors and land safely. Wow. And these things have safety built in where you can, everything can fail and you have to be able to fly several miles to put down safely. So it's actually, you know, people are, people are down on self-driving vehicles. I can't wait for self-driving vehicles. You know, I just can't wait. 
I think that the, the nut behind the wheel is the most dangerous <laughs> part of, uh, of any moving vehicle. You know? so, so we've grown up with it, so we don't think it's so bad. But my God, if, if someone uh. came from Mars and saw people driving around in their cars and their trucks, you know, especially Texting on a two-way traffic, and, yeah, yeah, two-way traffic yeah. and trucks coming at I you, know. man, it's... And even when I'm trying to be attentive, there's times when I don't know, I don't know what's happened. I, I take a third look and here comes a logging truck and I cannot believe I didn't see that. Right. So, yeah. Anyway, so, so good. When when I first, when I first saw that paper, I thought like, why did they put chapters in here? Why do they call them chapters? It's so old fashioned, but now I see that, uh, thanks to your explanation, they, this is a mini book they've written. It it really is. is. Yeah. Yeah. 47 uh, pages a really good look at a whole industry. And I noticed at one point they were talking about this could be a good solution for the next 30 to 50 years. Well, this is great Chinese long-term strategic thinking, right? Like we right, right. can sell one of these next month. And uh, right. you know, and so they're thinking about a, a, a really good potential solution to congestion and uh, moving things around cities, you know, and, and, and more power to them, you know? Exactly. And so that made me think of two things. So number one, we talk about a skeptic would learn. You would learn something. That's valuable. You'd almost pay for a report like that. It's 47 oh, yeah. pages. Yeah. Quite extensive. No matter what your perspective was, it's you're going to come away knowledgeable. Um, and then it's going to be, it, it kind of raises the whole industry because you it, it really adds legitimacy. And so you're going to get, because you got to get partners on board. Um, I spoke with Honeywell. They have, a, they have a long aviation history, like 100 years. And they're now in a division moving into um, these UAVs. And so they're, they have this, it's incredible that companies like this, you want to be working with these partners that have this incredible legacy and also have a background in like, air, air, air traffic right now is super, super safe. It's, um, it's in the past 50 years, airline travel has become, right. we know it's safer than driving your car. So um it's 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 pretty cool stuff. So anyway, I, I should we should add that a white paper does not have to be forty seven pages. I have no idea how long that is. This is the longest one I've read. So yeah, it's it's yeah. it's headed into ebook territory here. Yeah, yeah, but it kept your interest. And you know what it reminds me of, Brian, is that where these things came from in the first place. Like these these things emerged around 1900, 1890 for the British government, and they were like position papers or factual wrap-ups of an entire industry or an entire technology where somebody would would come up with a report and give it to all the cabinet ministers you know and and it, they were very objective and this is what this is what that one is doing it's doing an industry report on on this whole emerging uh, uh thing and it it's it's right back to where these started and excellent uh excellent job on that especially when talking about their competitors that, that's yeah great. yeah yeah and I should add, I'm going to throw it to you because I really want to hear this one that could use improvement. But for, for all these white papers, we um, we won't send these to you. We have them. Some of them you can't get. Some of them we don't know how you can get, how they ended up in our private collection. But a number of these that are current, the companies are still using them. They're gating them for um, lead gen and stuff. So we, mm-hmm. we won't. You, you kind of enjoy the screenshots. But if you want them, you, you probably need to go find them yourself. So maybe register it right on yeah the, yeah yeah give me yeah. your name yeah. okay gordon what do you got i hear you've got well, one that could you know, use it's, some... it's it's funny the the company name has already been uh has already been given but it's uh so uh i'll start sharing my screen right so i came across this one um because i used to work for a company that sold software see the thing the guy's uh holding it's a barcode scanner okay right? yeah, I, yeah my company made the uh software that would hook up barcoding to ERP systems like SAP <clears throat> and Oracle, you know, and so that was around the year 2000 and I was working, uh, I was the VP of marketing for them. So a, a couple of years ago, maybe a, I think it was just a, a year ago, I went looking to see what had happened to these companies. We used to resell that hardware in my company and in, in that during the interim, Honeywell has bought that hardware company. Okay, oh, so- okay doesn't exist anymore. It was called Intermec. And so I, I was poking around. I came across this on their website under white papers. I thought, hey, hey great. I want to see what they're what they're doing. And uh, I got to tell you, I have nothing against Honeywell. Like I, uh, I've written some uh, very favorable stuff uh, with Honeywell. I've got a Honeywell programmable um, thermostat keeping my house <laughs> yeah, We warm. all do, I'll, right? You know, <laughs> I, I think it's a, it's a good yeah. company. And when I saw the cover here, I thought like, hey, 
look at this. They don't, they didn't get a stinking, you know, stock picture of a model working in a warehouse. They got this kind of schlumpy guy who needs a haircut and he sort of looks like a typical guy that would be doing some barcoding. I've been in these factories. I've, you know, they're blue collar workers. They're not models. So right off the bat, I like the title. Uh, uh, the title, I like the cover, Five Ways to Improve Accuracy in Your Medium-Sized DC. DC is Distribution Center. It's the new okay, word okay. for like a warehouse, right? So if we uh, if we start looking inside, um, oh, still lots of pictures here, a couple of call out, full quotes, um, Honeywell Research, it costs 10 times as much to bring an incorrect order back as to send it out right in the first place. Stuff that I knew about um, about barcoding, uh, the main benefit is more accuracy. Okay, so they're doing some sort of industry um, specs and things here. That's uh, that's great. And uh, then the next page. Oh, we got more pictures. Oh, five ways to improve accuracy. Okay, I want to learn these five ways. It sounds like like five tips, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Name. Okay, great. I want to hear five ways that I can make my distribution center more accurate, you know? So um, I'm going along, still lots of pictures, but it makes it easy to read. You know, heck, it's pretty easy to read. So here's the five ways, uh, five ways. Honeywell's unified software and hardware platform. Okay, that's one of the ways. Honeywell wearable solutions. Number three, Honeywell voice directed <laughs> solutions. And number four, vehicle mounted computer solutions from Honeywell. And um, number five is a fantastic picture, but it's material handling solutions from Honeywell. Oh my gosh. And then, I'm, hear, I'm hearing a pattern it. here. That's it. That's it. It's like, that, you've got to be kidding me. This is not a white paper. This is a brochure. Yep. But let's, let's look yep. at it again. It's got beautiful uh, photos. Yeah. Not many words. You yeah. Know? And the, the message when you get into it, the five ways are just five product lines from Honeywell. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was I was really put off by this. And I think I think that most readers would be a, a B2B prospect to who's running a distribution center. If he's looking for a white paper or she, they do not want a sales pitch. And this is the thing that I've seen in, in survey after survey. I don't even uh, keep track of these surveys anymore because it's so obvious. And I've talked to people when they when they're looking at a white when they're looking for a white paper, they want information, useful, practical, handy information. You know, they do not want a sales pitch. If they wanted a sales pitch, they would call up. 1-800-BUY-NOW and talk to a salesperson. They're doing their initial research. This is content marketing people. They're doing their initial research sort of in stealth mode. You don't even know that they might be looking for some, you know, a, a way to improve by uh, buying some new technology. So just listing your lines of business, my God, that is not, um, that is not a white paper. And I've got, I've got some metrics about that too, you know, so let's, uh, uh, I counted up all the uh, text in this paper and I analyzed it pretty carefully. There's not that much text, uh, 1,125 words. Normally, I think that's too short for a white paper. Um, 75 words in the intro and 300 words about the problem. That first page I was I was looking at before this, um, this is uh, this is like okay industry information. You know, this is okay this part. So. It, at the start, it's sounding okay. But as soon as they get into the five ways, it's got 600 words on Honeywell and 150 words about the company. So that is two thirds of the words in this thing are all about Honeywell. I, I rest my case. This is not a white paper with useful practical information. Wow. It's a sales pitch. It's a brochure masquerading as a white paper beautifully designed, beautiful pictures, but there's not much real content. Could anybody look at this and say like, oh, I got a really good tip out of that uh, white paper from Honeywell. Man, I really learned something. No, all you learn is they've got five different divisions selling barcoding stuff and they've got an agency that knows how to put nice pictures out. So listen, Honeywell is a $40 billion company. And based on this example, they do not get content marketing at all. This should not be on their website under the section for white papers at all. So I, I rest my case. You know, they're breaking <laughs> rule number one. They're, they're breaking rule number one for uh, white papers, which is making it a sales pitch. And really, don't do that. Yeah, do yeah. That. First thing you can do. You know what it reminds me of? It's when you get a, um, there, there's, there's salespeople who are like, 
they're great resources and you go to them to get information because they, you know, they, they're going to, you're going to learn a lot from them. And then there's salespeople that just, they're, they're sell, 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 right? So no matter what your, no matter what your question is, the answer is widget X, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And so you yeah. only really want to engage with them when you're going to place an order. Otherwise you would avoid someone who's just going to start, you know, start hard selling when you can. Yeah. Absolutely. And here they're just doing a scatter shot. They're just giving you five, five possible ways to spend your money with us. You know, and your, and your head is reeling by the time you get to the end of it. It doesn't even have any tip about how to know which of the five is the key one for you. It, all it is is a brochure saying, we got this, we got yeah. that, buy this, buy that, you know, yeah, talk to yeah. us, talk to us. Who's going to talk to them after they see that? Uh, you know, often what, what, you know, how B2B complex sales work you know, is that there's a there's a, a nagging problem that some company is trying to solve, and they say to somebody, research this, find, get me some options. You know, just like uh, Captain Kirk used to say, get a spot, get me options. You know, <laughs> so they somebody goes running around looking for ways to improve their distribution center. They come across this. Is this helpful? Can they take this to their boss and say, well, we've got five options from Honeywell. No, you can't. You don't have right. anything substantial there to, to work with. So uh, right. uh, that's why I put that in my um, sad uh, library of failed white papers, because it will not achieve its purpose. It looks beautiful. You know, somebody said on their editorial calendar, check, we did a white paper, but it will not generate any leads or impress anybody or build any mind share for Honeywell. It, it, it's a flop. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's one of the things, I know it's fearful. I know sales managers, they want to sell, sell, sell. I know, I'm sorry if I'm blaming sales managers because there's probably ones that don't think like this. But they don't understand that if you only flog your product to a skeptical prospect, it sounds like you really don't know your industry. If you can't talk about the whole, if you're not an expert on the whole industry, um, then yep. you need to, like, like my, I always use the analogy of the pool, the swimming pool, the guy that he was the, the famous content marketer who did a, had a swimming pool company. And he would talk about, he did, I think he did fiberglass pools, but he had a ton of info on concrete pools on his site because he knew his people were um, considering a concrete pool. So he put out a ton of stuff on what might be great about a concrete pool. And, you know, and then obviously why they landed on why they're doing it the way they do, but it's like stuff like costs. Anyway, so I always feel like it shows supreme confidence. Like in the Ehong paper, we were just looking at when you, yeah, I'll list my competitor. I'll, I'll list all my, everything yeah. about my competitor I can find, you know, and it's a, yeah, makes it a better source. So, okay. Last question for you. Um, what, how common is that? How common do you find it? That it's it's a the number brochure. one mistake. It, it's okay. the number one mistake that people uh, do with uh, white papers, and it, it's it's because they're emerging. They're generally emerging from the the sales and marketing divisions. Like those are the people that do um, that do that kind of content. And if some if some salesperson says, "We need more leads. We need more leads for my for my sales force. Uh, come on, get us some leads." Like the 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 marketing team is thrown into a tizzy. We got to generate leads. We got to generate leads. Uh, let's put out a white paper. And sometimes the you know, these things get reviewed and by by groups of people in companies. And sometimes it's really hard to resist that that pressure to just talk about our products and our company and stuff. And somebody here like didn't resist it at all, you know, or maybe they snuck in that first 300 words. But, you know, it's it's a, a bad tendency because marketing and salespeople are always talking about their stuff. Yeah. And I think what's powerful about a white paper is it can take them out of that and back to the original problem that their stuff was created to solve in the first place. And they just walk around all day long. Oh, we have the best. We have the best technology. Oh yeah, we're the best. They don't walk around saying, oh yeah, that's a tough, that was a tough uh, problem that we solved, you know, 10 years ago. And we've been selling the same thing over, over ever since. And they never say that's still a tough problem. We haven't quite solved it yet. You know, they never say that. Like, uh, so I think that uh, uh, to me, a, uh, uh, problem solution white paper goes right back to square one and says like, here is a nagging, rotten, expensive, uh, terrible problem haunting our whole industry. Nobody's ever really solved it properly. Uh, look what they've tried. They've tried this. They've tried that. They've tried the other. None of that stuff works. We got a new, new idea. We think our new idea is the best. Here's our new idea in generic terms, like, uh, like you were saying before, generically, not with a product name. And so then you're still you're still educating people about a market space. 
right? They come away from that thinking like, oh yeah, we tried that thing and it never did work. And we were thinking about trying this other thing, but now I see how that probably wouldn't work either. You're, you're giving people a mental map of a, right. of a market space, which is you're what saving you're them. And saving them a lot of effort to hunt that down themselves. Yeah. It's like, well, okay, all yeah. right. I, oh, I see why we might want to do that. Yeah. And then awesome. you know you are. You're a, you're a trusted advisor. You're not just a peddler. You're not just a sales guy. You're somebody who's, who's standing beside a prospect with your arm around their shoulder saying like, listen, here's what I've learned. Here's what That's I've learned it. in my time in this industry. And then they, then they know you and like you and trust you. And they're more likely to buy from you. Yes. This is content marketing, folks. Yes. You know, it's not, and it's, it's not... like you've built equity with them. It's something you can bank on later. You know what I mean? I'll go yeah. back to you. I can trust you. Yeah. That's yeah. really viable. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's it for this, this um, episode, I guess, for calling these things. I just, oh, really? I love talking with you, Gordon. You're like so fun. We can fun. go on for hours. So I just want to um, say we've got, uh, we've got more of these planned um, upcoming. I think next time around, I get to share one that I feel actually, I think it's the worst I've ever seen. So you get, you guys got to see this one. And what, what do you, you have one that's pretty good. We're going to have a running battle to see who yeah. could come up with the worst white paper ever. And, and I, one thing we've been talking about doing is having, the, coming up with our putting our list together of the seven deadly sins of white papers and evaluating each one and seeing how many sins it'd be great to find one that breaks all seven you know like that would be really tremendous so the the value of that is like we're, we're going to be coaching you what not to do don't right do right things. and, and actually in the co i would love it if, if you're as you're watching this you in the throw in the comments what might be your your vote for some of these sins the worst white paper sins where everything's under consideration right now so um well, anyway, all right, we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. I just want to, here's my little blurb here, that if you, if you need to learn about white papers, if you need to write a white paper yourself, or if you need to hire a very expensive expert to write one for you, all the links are, are down below here. And um, we're going to help you on that. And anyway, we will be sure to subscribe and hit that bell so you know when a new one of these are coming out. Thank you, Gordon. Thank Great you, Brian. To talk to you. Yeah, Thank you, everybody. Fun. We'll talk to you soon. Adios.